Hello everybody, I'm really pleased uh, to have uh, on stage uh, for uh, the second part of the afternoon, Elliot, and uh, we'll be talking designs and lessons learned about design, I think. Oui, merci. Up to you, thanks. Merci. Welcome. Bonjour, Leon. Merci. Um, I'm going to start off with some apologies before I get going. Uh, the first apology is that as you may have guessed, I'm speaking in English, <laughs> so sorry about that one. If anything I say is in any way unclear at all, then come and grab me afterwards and we can have a chat about stuff. Um, the second apology is that I am just recovering from a cold. You may be able to hear that in my voice. Um, I may have to stop and blow my nose at some point <laughs> halfway through. Um, if I'm sniffing and snuffling and uh, you're getting a bit fed of that, maybe the sound guys can do us a favor and turn the, turn the mic down when I do that. Um, and the last apology is that I have one of these fancy new MacBooks, you know, this, the ones that came out this year, these lovely 12-inch things, and they're beautiful. They're so thin and light, and it's fantastic, uh, but it's only got one port, this USB-C port, which actually doesn't have a, a connector for um, VGA at the moment. So anyone who has these laptops basically cannot do uh, a presentation. So I'm using someone else's computer in PDF format. I'm hoping that it's all going to be good. Um, I think I'm losing one of my animated GIFs, which is a bit of a shame. But um, other than that, I will, I will crack on. So, quick introduction uh, to me. Um, I'm the creative director of Adobe Typekit, which was once a web font service and is now um, dealing with uh, fonts for sync for your, for, your laptop, for your desktop and for your devices, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, I also have a, a side project, a, a rather big side project, which is a lifestyle magazine called Largom, which I run with my wife, and we launched our first issue uh, last September, just over a year ago. And I had, prior to that, I had another side project which was also quite big, and it was also a magazine. It was called Eight Faces, and it was a magazine about typography. Is there anyone here in the audience who bought Eight Faces by any chance? Oh, there's a hand. Any other hands? I think there may have been one over there. Ah, fantastic. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Um, so, yes, we ran uh, for eight issues uh, from 2010 through to uh, May last year. And that was a lot of fun and kind of got me interested in print design and opened my eyes up to the world of typography, which I then sort of applied back to the web design I was doing. And, and it's, it's weird, now I'm kind of at a stage where I've, I've sort of stopped becoming a web designer in some ways, and I'm sort of more doing print and branding and things like that, and it's quite, quite surreal. And one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about today is... Um, my, my journey, as it, as it were. Now, I, I, I tend to not like talks where designers get up on stage and they just go through their portfolios. I find it really boring. It's very self-indulgent. Um, I'm not going to do that. Well, I am, I am going to do that. <laughs> but I'm going to show you some really terrible work. So <laughs> I'm going to show you some really early stuff that I did when I first started doing web design. And um, hopefully, it'll give us all something to, to laugh at. So to kick that off, um, Here's one of the first sites I've ever built now. I don't have the actual original uh, animated flash file for this anymore. Uh, this is one of the things that you find when you start trying to archive your, or, or show your old web work, that it all disappears. It all vanishes into the ether, which is one of the reasons I got into print, so that I would have something I could hold and would, would last. Um, but yeah, this, is, this website that you can sort of see here is a, a Flash website I did in about uh, 2002. So this was like the height of Flash. So when Flash was really, really cool, and there were all sorts of cool sites being made in Flash, everything was totally excessive. Absolutely ridiculous. And this site, I mean, sadly you can't see it in this version, but everything moved in it. So there were like these matrix style zeros and ones kind of falling down that followed your cursor. So wherever you were, they f fell down everywhere. Those little dots, those glowing dots there, they're the navigation, of course. <laughs> Completely unusable. Uh, everything made a sound. If you hovered over something, it made a sound. If you clicked on something, it made a sound. There were some clouds that moved. The logo kind of was glowing. It was just totally ridiculous. But I loved all this stuff, and I think you have to kind of go through some of this. Um, anyway, I did this while I was at university. It was one of the projects that, um, that, was, that I did in my second year, I think. And while I was at university, the university itself, I don't think, really equipped me with many uh, skills as such. It was more the stuff I was doing on the side. I did a lot of freelance work for for uh, friends and friends' bands and, and friends of friends' bands, stuff like that. And I ended up with a, a portfolio that had quite a lot of music-related stuff in it. And thanks to that, 
uh, when I left university, I got a job at EMI Music, which was at the time was my absolute dream job. And this was the first site that I built there for Joss Stone. Um, again, completely ridiculous Flash stuff. Now, this was in the era of Flash, like pixel fonts and all that. Remember that? The good old days? The heady days of pixel fonts? What about those scrollers? They had those scroll bars that like, did easing and stuff. Remember that? That was good fun, that was. So um, I basically did, did that for everything there, and it was kind of silly, and again, everything moved. And it had auto-playing music. Oh my god, what an awful sin that is, auto-playing music. Um, and especially with Joss Stone, I'm personally not a fan, so while I was developing this, it was pretty painful. Um, Atomic Kitten. I uh, don't know if Atomic Kitten made it to France. <laughs> Atomic, they did? Okay, poor you, okay. So, <laughs> uh, so I did Atomic Kitten's website, and this was quite fun because in the music industry, especially then anyway, uh, I mean, they're just so badly organized. They would book things for radio and TV months and months in advance, but for the website, they kind of wanted it done tomorrow. They always forgot about it. Oh, yeah, we're launching the album tomorrow. We need something. Um, but the benefit, which I didn't realize at the time, but I do realize now with the gift of hindsight, is that... I could kind of do whatever I wanted because they were so desperate, these marketing managers, to kind of get anything out there that I was able to just sort of go, oh, hey, let's put in these weird, like, shapes at the top that have nothing to do with Atomic Kitten or anything. But personally, I was having fun with, and I got to just do that. So that was kind of quite fun. Um, things started to change gradually. Did some stuff for Dr. John, which was quite cool, again, with the easing sliders and pixel fonts. Uh, some e-cards for Pet Shop Boys. Anyone remember uh, e-cards? Come on. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> e-cards, yeah. So kind of, yeah, ridiculous. You know, silly animated little flash things that you would send to a friend. Um, you know, one of those awful things that brands have been wanting you to share. I guess we haven't really moved on from that. Um, and then gradually, I think, hopefully, it, I started to pare back the flash design a bit. Still pixel fonts, still lots of animation, but hopefully it started to get a little bit more tasteful. Um, and one of the highlights was I got to work on uh, Massive Attack's website. Um, so I designed this when they had their Best Of album um, come out. And that was really, really good fun, uh, because I'm a, a big Massive Attack fan, and I got to work with them directly, which was fantastic. And that was, that was one of the, the highlights early on when I was in EMI. And then I started to do these things, these other kind of e-cards that had lots of animations in. But the, the, what I was doing here is I, I, my, one of my frustrations with Flash is that it was always very, I, you know, I didn't really like getting into the code too much. Like I didn't like having to learn action script and, you know, deal with all this complicated sort of math-like stuff just to, just to do what I thought would be, a, you know, a cool animation or something. So this guy joined the team and he was, um, he was just a fantastic action script developer. And working with him taught me about working with other people that maybe you don't need to do everything yourself, that maybe it's okay to call on someone else who their strengths, you know, their strengths are doing the code and, and they are really into it and they can do it faster and better than you can. So actually that's okay. And I remember that being one of those moments where I thought, hey, I don't have to struggle and like do this entire website from the ground up. You know, it's nice to actually be, be able to kind of call a friend and, and um, you know, rely on his strengths. So I did some of that stuff there, um, lots of e-cards, very kind of grungy stuff. This is all very much in at the time. And then as we move on from the heady days of Flash, we got into um, HTML and CSS. Now, at the time, the people at EMI weren't particularly into it, and we were a pretty small uh, web design team. And I started to get into standards and you know, read stuff by you know, Jeffrey Zeldman and Dan Cederholm and Eric Meyer and people like that and really wanted to you know, embrace HTML, CSS. But as there's this kind of this in-between stage. So this site I did for Beth Orton, there's kind of still Flash in it. So the, um, the actual audio player is still Flash-based. And because this is you know, before Ajax and all stuff like that, because you wanted the audio to carry on playing when you move from different pages, everything's all iframes. So where you see that text there, that's just basically just an iframe in there. And you know, we look back on it now, and it's such a terrible way to build a website. But at the time, this was you know, how things were done, and even this was better than Flash. Um, I did some similar sort of thing for Richard Ashcroft's site. Uh, had an amusing meeting with him where he just sat at the end of this massive boardroom table smoking a spliff and not really saying anything. Um, Hilary Duff, another e-card, and he got to make, uh, what are they called, buddy icons. Remember them? This is like the first wave of animated GIFs before they recently became cool again. 
lots of fun. Uh, this was the last site I did there for this charity that EMI, EMI have, um, and this was all standards-based, I think, apart from this really, really small flash player. And I was really getting into web standards, and I thought, hey, this is the way you know, we should be doing things. And so I moved to Sanctuary Records, which is another record label, sadly now defunct, and the pace of life at Sanctuary was really different, whereas EMI was really hectic, and everything was like, oh, we need it tomorrow. Um, Sanctuary were kind of going down the, the, down the pan. They're, if anyone has ever heard of Sanctuary Records, uh, they are the record label uh, publisher who are owned by Iron Maiden's management. Um, and Iron Maiden's management are not actually very good with dealing with uh, money and stuff like that. So uh, there was all that. And um, the result of working at Sanctuary was suddenly I had loads more time to practice all this stuff. So learning HTML, learning CSS, I was afforded the time to actually just spend ages designing a website and actually work on my own site as well while I was still designing stuff. Um, and this site here was for Trojan Records, and this was, um, I think I used this one for, for like a tutorial that I wrote for Computer Arts, I think, which was my sort of first um, foray into, into writing for, for magazines and, and books and stuff like that. And, you know, I talked about, you know, grunge, how to make a grunge background and all this kind of fun stuff. And we, this is the Sanctuary uh, New Media website, which is we kind of operated this little web design team, sort of um, almost like an agency within Sanctuary. So um, it was nice because we could take on external work that wasn't just part of the, the label itself. But as I said, it was all kind of going down the pan, and it was really quiet, and I got some time to work on my own site. And this was the first version of my site that I put, well, it was like the fourth version, but the first one that I kind of tried to push um, publicly. Um, and this is like the heady, the heady days of grunge. So this is me properly being in you know, my grunge phase, and uh, <laughs> you know, background textures and brushes and all that kind of ridiculous stuff. Actually, it's not ridiculous. I kind of miss it now. When you look at flat design, um, I think maybe we should bring grunge back. And uh, after, after leaving the music industry, I went to work for a guy, a guy called Ryan Carson. And he had a company at the time called Carson Systems, later rebranded as Carsonified before they, they did uh, future web apps, future web design events, stuff like that. And again, looking at lots of standard stuff and doing lots of event sites, basically. And that was fun. Um, doing that, I basically sort of consolidated all these different sites they had and gave them a new style and blah, blah, blah. And then when I left, Mike Coos came and did the same thing, and he, he did some really, really cool stuff for them. Um, sadly, really, really low-res screen grab. Again, really difficult to find old work, but there we go. Uh, this is, you know, back in, I don't know, oh, it's cut off, but you can just about see there's some wooden backgrounds, because this was the day of wooden backgrounds. Lots of fun. Um, but anyway, in May 2008, I decided to go freelance. And I'd kind of been doing freelance work pretty much the entire time that I'd been working professionally because, you know, it was just a nice creative outlet. And I worked for friends of friends and I, you know, got a bit of pocket money to spend and everything. Um, and it got to a point in 2008 where I knew that I would either have to give up freelancing or, or give up my job. And so I gave up my job and went, went freelance full time, which I think was, was one of the one of the best decisions I, I could have made. And um, I also moved to Norway briefly at the time. Uh, my girlfriend and I went traveling independently. And um, yeah, it was a really, really fun period. And I started doing some, some sites for a whole bunch of clients um, and getting to choose who I worked with. Oh, this Fusion Ad site was, the, I think, the first site I did where it used, uh, that used uh, web fonts. And uh, this was like using web fonts in the really bad way, like literally uploading the files to the server. And this is before WAF and EOT and stuff. So this is like, you know, putting uh, open type and true type files on the server that anyone could steal if you looked at the source. Pretty bad. Uh, <laughs> and of course, it's using Museo. But that's OK, because Museo wasn't massively overused in 2008. Uh, did some stuff for Decode. Um, these are a development company. And we had this really good relationship where I would design some stuff for them kind of for free. And they would develop some stuff for me for free, uh, which was handy. They did like uh, the back end to the first version of the Eight Faces website and stuff like that. Really nice relationship. Um, and they did this really cool t-shirt company uh, called Belong, and started doing some branding and illustration for them for that. And then this event that we put on called Activate, which was like basically like a day out for web geeks. Like, get outside, play, climb up some walls, 
swinging the trees, that kind of thing. Um, for, for freelancers who didn't have office parties and other such, you know, team building days, stuff like that. So that was good fun. Um, and as I said, around this time, I started to get a bit more into sort of doing branding and logos and things like that. Um, so I did the branding for Brooklyn Beta, and this was the first version of the Brooklyn Beta website. And they're good friends of mine, um, and they, they kept the brand throughout, which I'm, which I'm really pleased about. Uh, and this site here for Ampersand, which is, uh, I don't know if anyone knows this, is a web typography conference in the UK, run by Richard Rutter. Um, this was the first responsive site that I ever, that I ever um, built. And a lot of the stuff that I did with that one, I still kind of try and apply to, to my work today, like things like you know, paying attention to the measure, the line length. And I'll, I'll go into that into some detail in a sec. And I was, did some branding and web work for the Tech Fellow Awards. Um, and this was, this was after I'd done, a, I think, the first issue of Eight Faces, and I'd got real, like my typography nerd head on. And uh, this site had things like, um, it, every, all the type is aligned to a baseline grid, which is like <laughs> really ridiculously hard to do on the, online. And um, I actually tend to not try and do it anymore because it's almost, almost pointless and almost futile. Uh, but it was quite a fun exercise. And then the very last bit of client work I did uh, before taking some time off from that and, and, and forming a different company uh, was Smashing Magazine. So, um, so you have me to thank for the uh, <laughs> Smashing Website. Uh, website. I, I, it's not to me about the ads, okay? I really tried to push for like an ad-free version, but they need the ads to make money, so there we go. Um, and all along while I was doing some web work, I, I really liked illustration as well. So I'd always done drawing and things like that from when I was a kid. And I wanted to continue that. You know, I still like doing it. Um, and I, I didn't really want to become an illustrator. I don't think I'm good enough to become an illustrator. But I like doing it on the side. And every now and again, a client work, client project would come up um, that required some illustration. So I did some stuff for Virgin Group, which was cool. Um, and then Andy Clark wrote a book called Hardboard CSS. And the front cover is illustrated by Kevin Cornell. But there are um, sort of section spreads for the different parts of the, of the book. Uh, I think three or four of them, and I illustrated them in a kind of sort of similar to uh, sort of Mike Mignola, Frank Miller sort of style. Uh, this was an unused illustration I did for Microsoft, as a sort of a poster t-shirt design thing. I can't remember why they didn't use it, but bastards. Um, and I also started doing some, I don't, know, I don't know what you call this really, but like stuff that uses type in a kind of manipulated way that is kind of... It's, it's not branding, it sort of like goes towards illustration, but it's like not drawn, and just, just playing with type, basically, and do, doing things with type, and I, I did some of this for the Interlink conference, um, and I started dipping my toe into the world of, of print design, uh, initially with things like, with, with posters and little pamphlets and CD packaging and stuff like that, so a friend of mine in Norway. Um, the odd t-shirt design, stuff like that, again, just sort of playing with type. And then what happened was I reached this point where, like I said before, I got tired of all of my work sort of disappearing and finding it so hard to find my old work. And I wanted to have something that, that had some permanence that would sit on a bookshelf and it would last and it would not disappear, you know, unless you had a fire or something like that, or you chose to get rid of it. To, to get rid of it. And so I decided I'm going to make this magazine um, called Eight Faces, about typography. And at the time, I'd, this is around the time that web fonts were kind of becoming a thing, and the people in the web community were becoming more aware of type. And it was a really, really good, good age. You know, when you look back to it from now, this is kind of really where web design really started to up its game around this time, like 2009-ish, something like that. Anyway, so I created Eight Faces as a way, as a very a, a selfish way of, of me getting to do something for myself that I could keep. Um, and I didn't expect it to be uh, successful in any way. I just wanted it to, to, wanted to make something for myself. I wanted to learn about a large-scale print project. And fortunately, um, it was actually really successful. The first issue we sold out of really, really quickly, I think in the first couple of hours. And that actually went the way with all of the other eight issues that we did. Um, haven't ever reprinted any. I'm currently working on a book that sort of combines and redesigns and, and tweaks and everything, all of that stuff. So that's going to be out at some point next year, hopefully. Um, but yeah, so I did eight, eight issues of these magazines, and, and while I was doing Eight Faces, um, the really interesting thing that uh, 
that happened was not only because of the subject matter, you know, physically talking to type designers and stuff like that, but just doing print work and, and having people like Eric Spiegelman look over the work and, and give feedback and say, oh, you know, you've set this type, you know, it's tracked far too tightly and blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's an awful widow or, or an orphan that you've let in there. And, and that kind of feedback allowed me to, to get better at typesetting and also to go back to web design with new eyes to, to go in and, and do stuff like, you know, let's try aligning everything to the baseline grid on a website and, and you know, paying real attention to type and, and treating type with the, the respect it deserves. Um, this um, article here by Oliver Reichenstein is, I think, 10 years old today and very, very relevant still. So, so if you haven't read that, do, do have a look at it. Um, so a couple of years ago, I think it was a couple of years ago, I started delving into what you could do with open type features on the web. Um, and I have a whole talk that's kind of dedicated to this specifically, so I'm not going to go too, too much into the, in, the ins and outs of this because it gets a bit um, nerdy. But uh, these, the, the, the titles at the top, all are, it's all live web type, and it's using things like, and here it's using ligatures and uh, doing stuff with um, expert subsets so you can have actual um, old star numerals and act proper small caps, stuff like that, uh, swashes, and then how to do it if you don't have the open type support, this kind of thing. And then we've got uh, style sets as well, so you can swap out alternate cr characters. I realized I had this slide in this talk, uh, or another talk for ages, and realized that, well, it doesn't actually make any sense. The, those two things are the same, so it should actually look like this. And this is really handy. This is a really handy thing. If you're getting into type in, and looking at open type and what you can do on the web with it, um, this is, is really useful for things like th this, this typeface Brie by Type Together. Um, it's, it's got quite a lot of character. You know, it's, it's very curly. It's got these kind of crazy glyphs in there. Um, and if you want to use it, say you have to use Brie for your, for your company, for your client logo, or whatever, but you want to also set the body text in Brie, uh, but you don't want to have these crazy Zs and all things like that in there, then you can look into style sets and actually get some slightly toned down versions of the characters in there. Um, so it's a nice way of kind of keeping the brand consistent without, um, uh, without relying on those default glyphs that you get. Now, that's all kind of display stuff. Um, and where my interest has started to go was really things like, how do you set really, really good body type? And this is one of the, this is one of the uh, things, the experiments that I did with um, leading, like line length, actually keeping it you know, really nice and, nicely and readable. And so this little, this is like a digital version of a, of a magazine that I, I did when I was working at uh, Viewport Industries with my friend Kia. Um, so if you look at this, what this does is this is you know mobile-ish kind of uh, viewport width, and as you expand it, the the font size increases. Okay, makes sense. But then when the font size increases, then you end up with eventually you end up with really long lines. So what do you do? Well, maybe you then shrink the container a bit. So we have the credits float over to the left there, and actually the main body text gets over on the right, and it, it squishes a bit. And then it gets a bit wider, and the, the font size increases again. And this kind of um, this technique, this, this upping of the font size and then the shrinking of the container, is basically kind of a, the approach that I've used since then to, to pretty much any web project, um, anything uh, where you have large amounts of body type that, that you want to set and, and not have the line length become unruly. And this is kind of the code behind it in a nutshell. I hate it when people put code on screen. It's really difficult. And I, you know, as, as an audience member, I hate kind of just staring up at the code and trying to remember it or whatever. This, this is as much code as I'm going to show, I promise. Uh, but the, yeah, the basic principle is this. You, know, you up the font size a bit, and then when you get to a slightly higher viewport, you then bring the container in a bit. And here you're adding uh, padding to the HTML, but it could be whatever you want to do. It could be the width of the div or whatever. Then you up the font size as it grows, and then you bring the container in. And it kind of does this, basically. That's, the, that's how it goes. And I need to find some scientific term for describing this, uh, rather than just sort of flailing my arms around. Um, but that, yeah, that kind of works. It kind of works all right. Um, and I like to do this kind of by feel, just looking at things and seeing how long does that, does that line look? You know, does it, is it starting to get uncomfortable? Are we reaching a point where you know, I have my eyes struggling to jump to the next line? Is it too short? Um, and all sorts of things as well. When you have shorter lines, you know, what do you want to, um, what do, you want to do to the, to the leading as well for the, for the line height? There's all these kind of considerations. But if, you, if you're doing this and you're thinking, well, I'm not sure I can get a feel for exactly how long 
this is. You know, is, is it too long? Is it too short? Trent Walton has a really great technique where he inserts uh, asterisks uh, between the, I think, the 45th and 75th characters, which Robert Bringhurst in his sort of, uh, typographic Bible says is the ideal, um, that amount of characters is the ideal line length between 45 and 75. So you insert the asterisk there, and then you, as you're bending and stretching your viewport, which you know, we all love to do a lot, spend all our day doing this with, uh, with the websites, when those asterisks appear on the same line, then you know, or at least you, you assume, that you ha then have a line length which is too long. And then you kick in a media query and uh, kick it into shape. And that's, that's, the, that's the theory behind it. So really, really nice technique from Trent there. Um, this, how are we doing for time? Can I go into geeky algorithms? So, okay, right, well, so this is a little thing that Bram Stein, who is a colleague of mine at Typekit, he wrote for Eight Faces a few issues back. Um, he wrote it about the, um, the different algorithms used in browsers for uh, justifying uh, text. Now, uh, these things change over time, of course, um, and Basically, basically the, it's, there's nothing in the, the CSS spec that says what algorithm you have to use. And so the, the Nuth Plus algorithm, which is like the better one used by like InDesign and stuff like that, ne almost never gets used on the web and um, browsers go for the, the kind of the feeble one, which doesn't do a very good job, but is kind of better for CPU and stuff like that. Um, and he, he kind of describes the like the difference in, in these ones. So um, I'm, I'm not going to go too much more into it because it, it does get kind of, once you delve down that rabbit hole, it's pretty intense. Um, I have collected on this, on this, white, on this website, um, advancedwebtypography.com, which is not really much more than the holding page at the moment, but it is a list of links um, for these articles. Um, so if you, if you want to read into this some more and you haven't wanted to scribble down those URLs, just have a look at that one. And this has got links to those other articles on it. Um, and this is really specifically to do with a lot of open type stuff. Um, and open type might sound, you know, a little bit boring sometimes, but actually, when you when you get into it, it's one of the ways that you can really, really do some fine typesetting on the web. So worth looking into. Anyway, as I was saying. Uh, after Smashing Magazine, I took a break from doing client work, and I formed a company with my friend Kia Whitaker called Viewport Industries. And our idea behind Viewport Industries, and I was still doing eight faces at the time, um, but our idea was that we would put out a series of products. And so we did a bunch of things. Uh, we did uh, a magazine called Digest that existed for one issue before we decided to kill the company. Uh, we did uh, a little iPhone app, which was just a bit of fun. Uh, we did this massive print project called Insights of the Book, which was 256 pages. It was interviews with a lot of people from uh, the web tech industries about how they got started, that kind of thing. Um, really, really proud of it, actually. Um, I think a lot of people said that it was you know, really nice for, for them to read that even the really big names ended up doing what they're doing, mainly because of luck and being in the right place at the right time and, and kind of fudging their way through it and stuff like that. We still have some left, so if anyone's interested in that, um, I think we have like a massive box sitting in a factory somewhere, so I can send you one if you want. Um, and we did a bunch of events as well, um, based around this Insights brand. And we did some w this thing called Comp Shop, which was like a mix of a conference and a workshop, pretty much as it says on the tin. And we did these mini things where we would get people together at Christmas, just before Christmas, where people would usually have office parties and stuff, and get people to just over beers, just talk about their year and the things that went well and things that didn't go well. And it was a really nice way of getting a bunch of web folks together. And people were really open about stuff. People t you know, really went pretty deep into um, what happened in their year. You know, some, it was pretty, pretty touching, some of this stuff. Um, and yeah, basically, stuff that's very different from just doing web design. That's kind of, that's kind of the things that have kept me interesting, uh, is that, um, or keep me interested, rather. I'm not very interesting. <laughs> I'm interested by, um, by things which are varied, which things which span across multiple media. And so that's how I've kept sane. Um, he, oh, here's some pictures of Insights of the book, just so you can see it. We, we did it in like this, um, this nice presentation box that's like got blind embossing on the front and foiling and all this kind of fun stuff. Um, uh, yeah, it was, it was huge. It's a beast. If you chucked it at someone, it's pretty dangerous. Um, and we'll probably end up doing that uh, <laughs> with all the stock we got in the factory if you don't order it from me. Anyway, uh, all of this stuff, all of this print stuff, all of this type stuff, um, 
eventually led to uh, me getting a phone call from, from Typekit. And their, uh, their, at the time, creative director Jason Santa Maria had left. Uh, and they had no, basically no, no um, design talent on the team, although a lot of the developers are very design savvy. And I started doing some freelance work for Typekit, and um, we eventually made that a permanent thing, and then I became their creative director, and I think that was about, it's about two, and, two and a half years ago now, actually. So that's kind of shot by. Um, and it's interesting because although I'd done web work for years and years and years, the thing that they told me that they that they liked was that I'd done eight faces. So something that I'd done that existed in the world of print, that existed purely because I wanted to do something different for myself, a purely selfish project, um, something that was wildly different from everything else I'd done for, for clients and, and in-house and all sorts. That was the thing that kind of got me the job, which I found really bizarre. Um, and kind of goes to show that, you know, it's not necessarily about your portfolio being full of what you do as your day job, that actually doing your own stuff on the side can be really, really beneficial. Anyway, the stuff I did with Kia, uh, which we decided to end after, after a few years to, to kind of do other stuff. He's now working at Shopify and obviously doing Typekit stuff. Um, I wanted to carry on doing uh, a magazine. I really liked the process of of, of creating eight faces, I oh man, there is nothing like that feeling of releasing a product and then seeing on like Instagram and Twitter and Facebook people taking pictures of it, like next to their coffee or you know just arriving on their doormat or anything like that. That is a wonderful, wonderful feeling. If you've never done it, if you've never released a physical product, I encourage you to do so, no matter how small, no matter what it is, because uh, it is a really, really amazing feeling to start seeing people who you, who you don't know at all on the other side of the world taking pictures of your thing and telling you that they, that they like it and, and that they're enjoying it or that maybe something in there has inspired them to change something. That's a, that's a really, really wonderful feeling. I feel very lucky to have, to have been able to experience that. Um, and I wanted to continue doing things like that and I wanted to continue doing print and I also wanted to work with my wife who is a writer and we'd done bits of work together on Eight Faces but it was sort of mainly my thing and we wanted to do something that was very much us together. So we created this magazine Lagom, uh, just over a year ago. We've just released our third issue, like literally just over three weeks ago, which is over there on the, on the right. Um, it's a bit of a beast. Uh, it's 144 pages. Um, it, as I say, it's a lifestyle magazine. Our, our, our general thing is um, a celebration of innovation and creativity. So it's people doing interesting things, interesting spaces, interesting places, a lot of makers, a lot of artisans, um, people with interesting side projects and hobbies. And we try and you know, focus on people who aren't necessarily that well known, but whose stories we really want to tell. Um, and unlike a lot of lifestyle magazines, which are kind of ridiculously minimalist and quite poncy, quite frankly, you know, they, they kind of ask you to spend a lot of money to attain the lifestyle they're presenting to you inside. We try and be a bit more down to earth and a little bit more accessible. I hope, I hope that we've achieved that. Um, so I'm going to go into detail and log on in a sec, but first of all, I'm going to nerd out on some design details with eight faces and get back to talking about some, some type geekery stuff. So uh, just so you know, um, in eight faces, the, we had these spreads these where each uh, interviewee would choose their favorite typefaces. And I designed them for the first issue, and I really didn't like what I'd done, so I called in uh, another designer. For the first few issues, it was John Tan, don't know if you know him, um, who designed a bunch of them. And then after that, um, Stefan Weyer, who's a designer in uh, Cologne, uh, designed them from issue five. So I would lay out most of the magazine, and these favorite spreads, these color spreads, would be done by Stefan. Um, but anyway, yeah. Doing Eight Face was lots, was lots and lots of fun. Uh, this is just a few samples of some of the pages in it. So you can see, and where are we? Okay, so here is a screen grab of it in InDesign. And I just want to talk a little bit about the proportions. So essentially everything is based off the baseline grid. And, and you know, when this really was a huge eye-opener for me at the time when I was just doing web design stuff and was just about caring about grids, but certainly not things like baseline grids and proportions and stuff like that. So if you have a look here, you can see the grid. Um, if you have a look at the, the body type, the, the leading, so the line height, is, uh, I can't remember what it is, I think it's, I think it's 7.5 point over 11 point. So it's 11 point line height, um, and that 
through setting the type at that size, I thought, yeah, that looks about right. That looks like a decent amount of, uh, of, um, of loading. That looks, that looks readable, looks good. So I'm going to take that 11 point, I'm going to set that as my, my base unit. So that's what the baseline grid is from, from that. And then from that, we derive out other things. So if you have a look at the pull quote, you'll see that the X height of the characters um, exactly match that baseline grid as well. And then the, the, the height of the, the borders that surround that pull quote, same thing. Uh, the way that the images line up, everything like that, um, all conforms to those proportions set by the baseline grid, which in turn is set by the body type itself. Here you've got an example of like incremental leading, sorry, where you, if you have the type that is different size, it doesn't make sense to have the same leading because uh, you would end up with either massive gaps between the lines or too small gaps. So you align every other line or every three lines, every four lines, whatever, whatever makes sense. And so here you can see, you see those lines lining up, which is an example of incremental leading, which I've then come to use on websites as well. Everyone know the difference between n dashes and m dashes? Of course, of course you do, right, good, glad to know. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go into uh, a little bit of detail with um, Largon. So, as I said, this is our third issue that we just released. There's a few pictures of it inside, so you can see it. Um, got an interview with Neil Secretario, who's a really, he actually works for UPS by the day, but by, by night he's a, a lettering artist, does some really cool stuff. Uh, Chris Murphy, who's a lecturer in, uh, that was lecturer, by the way, not lecturer, which is different. Um, he's in Belfast, a friend of mine, and he um, enjoys a bit of wild swimming off the coast of Donegal, a really interesting hobby. Some really nice photos by Dan Rubin there. Uh, this is Hilla Shamir, uh, an artist from Tel Aviv who works with furniture, does some really, really interesting stuff by combining aluminium and wood. And at the point at which they fuse, you get this really cool like effect, this, this charcoal that's created around there. It's really, really, really cool stuff. Um, this is Sebastian Mulliart. I don't even know if that's how you pronounce his surname exactly, but he's a Swedish techno producer. He's actually pretty well known. He's one of the only sort of celeb-like people we have in, in there. Um, and he has this awesome uh, studio cabin in the woods just outside Malmo. And um, he, he did a really, really great interview with us. We got a guide to cycling, a scenic guide to cycling around the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, we have some really lovely illustrations for this article, which is about whiskey and sort of introducing people to the concept of whiskey. If you're a bit of a whiskey noob like me and you think, oh, I don't like whiskey, then this, was, this will change your mind, hopefully, and tell you what things to not say at dinner parties. Uh, we have an, uh, a, a, a chocolatier called um, Amelia Rope, who makes some really, really wonderful chocolate, and she talks about what is handmade? You know, everyone says handmade. Everyone's all about the artisanal and the, you know, the makers and you know, doing it by hand. But actually, what is that? Can you have a sustainable business that is actually handmade? Uh, maybe you can't. Maybe actually, in order to grow and to meet demand, you you actually need to to use machines. And maybe that's okay. Um, this piece here, just quickly, um, I went to Oslo and uh, did an interview with the guy that's behind the, the Thief, which is a really cool hotel there, and I shot these photos. And I want to just linger on this for a sec, because for me, I, I enjoyed this so much, not only because I like writing and I like taking photos every now and again, but I, it, was, it was so different from my day job, so different from my usual stuff, so far away from design, especially far away from web design. Um, that, but I was getting to do this. I was able to do this from sort of a commercial perspective, able to create a product that pe people would buy and hopefully enjoy. Um, and I was going to a hotel and, in, and talking to this hotel owner about a hotel and taking pictures of it. And it, it was so far away that, in a way, it seems completely ridiculous that I would even do it. Um, but that's the thing that kept me sane. I, I, I love just doing different stuff. Anyway, a little bit of geekery. I'm just keeping my eye on the time. Um, so. Page layout. There are numerous theories about how to best lay out a page and what the perfect grid is for a book or a magazine and things like that. Um, here's one Van de Graaff canon where you, uh, you uh, draw some lines from the edges of your, your paper and you, you connect those lines at different points and you get these points and then you get a content box and then that's your grid. That's where you place your content and you end up with these margins and footers and stuff like that. And then uh, another one is, is Rosa Varios, it is um, Gutenberg Canon, where you divide everything up into nine 
so nine across the top, nine uh, down the side, and you have these grids, and then you place your content there. And then the amazing thing is, is lots of these different theories uh, intertwine, such as this. You can actually see, just about hopefully see them overlaid, that they actually create the exact same thing. So um, it's pretty magical. And that was going to be an animated GIF. It's like an Italian Spider-Man thing or something. But anyway, my mind was blown when I saw that. Um, and if you're into that, and all this kind of crazy stuff about, you know, pi and, uh, and uh, the golden ratio appearing in nature and how that relates to human proportion, how that relates to proportion in design and stuff like that, then do have a look at this article. Really, really cool stuff. Again, a bit of a rabbit hole uh, once you go down it, but, but really, really interesting. Um, if you're interested in how those kind of things, again, golden ratio, uh, proportion in nature, uh, relates to music. This is really interesting. Owen Gregory did a great talk, and this is the vi this link here will take you to the video. It's crazy stuff. It's like if you if you take certain um, intervals in music, like ha harmonious intervals, that things that sound good, and apply those proportions to design, you find out that like the page layout stuff is like it produces the al almost the same kind of effects. Like a, a beautiful thing that you look at is kind of also the same as a beautiful thing that you hear. It's it's pretty crazy stuff. So just to take you few, through a few of those grids. So this is the this is the uh, this is the layout that I use for, for Logom. And so just quickly, a few of the layouts. So you can see I've got the content box there, as we found earlier. And then I've got my content in there, throwing it in there. Got pretty generous footers and stuff like that. We take that away. That's the thing. And then that's the actual finished printed page. You can see a few of these other things in here. There's some examples um, of some, again, you've got some, uh, some type over on the, on the left there for uh, incremental leading. So I'm going to skip through a few of these. But these grids are really handy because even things like where we're using a lot of illustration work and things look a little bit more freeform, it just gives you that handy bit of underlying structure um, that isn't necessarily super present when you see the final thing, but just kind of keeps, keeps it all held together quite nicely. So all of these projects that I've been doing have in some way ended up involving uh, money. Inevitably, when you go freelance, you have to kind of become a little bit of a business person dealing with clients and money and stuff. And when you're selling actual, actual products to people, then even more so. So I kind of always refer to myself as an accidental businessman because I don't really like the idea of being a businessman. But um, knowing about business and understanding certain things and having sort of models in your mind, um, I found to be relatively useful. So this kind of traditional bus idea of, of business of make, is kind of about making money. And this is, I think, why I don't like the idea of being a businessman, because it's, it's about this focus on money. You know? And I'm, I personally, that's, that's not what drives me. Um, but I think what I do, what like my company does, and I have a company that I, that I run with my wife, and all of our stuff goes through that, including you know, my type kit work and, and all our products and stuff, is simply doing what I love. And I think I'm really, really lucky. And it's very easy to say, go and do what you love. But you know, you've got to make money. You've got to, you can't just give up your job and, and have your, your children and your, and your partners and your house fall around you, because at the end of the day, one needs to survive. But all of these things can be uh, can, uh, encompassed within this. So you know, I have my day job. I do bits of design on the side. I do speaking gigs like this, the publishing products, and writing for books and magazines. I do some music making stuff as well. I put all of that through the business, which is great, because you get to put instruments and things like that through as legitimate business expenses. Um, but all of this stuff comes under one thing, which is you know, just doing what I want to do, basically, and, and trying to make some money as I do it. But a lot of the things that have run throughout all of this is the idea of having a side project. And I think having a side project is really important. And I'd say do it for these reasons. Have a side project to work with your friends, to escape from your day job, to fulfill your own needs, to help people out, to promote yourself, but most importantly, to have fun. And that's, that's kind of my motivation when I've been uh, creating these things. And if you're not having fun, then there's no point. So these are some of the sponsors that we have for Logon. And the reason I'm showing these, and we have a few more really cool companies now, like uh, Free Agent and Ableton and people like that. Um, it's great because they kind of believe in what we're doing and they help us. They put up some money that helps us uh, with our production costs, with our, with our paying our contributors, stuff like that. And it's always been very important for me to kind of partner with the right companies who have the same kind of ethos as us. You know, it's not, 
it's not shameless in any way. It's the, we kind of have these shared beliefs. And these companies are really, really great, so it's a pleasure to be working with them. And this is quickly is our log on um, business model, essentially. Now, again, I'm an accidental businessman. I don't really like going into the ins and outs of business models. So for me, this is about as complex as it gets. I like to keep it pretty, keep it pretty simple. So the money going out, our expenses are our printing costs. By far our biggest cost with the magazine, as you would imagine, is our print bill. It's very, very big. Very, very big. Um, our contributor costs are the other one. Now, a lot of magazines don't pay contributors, and I really disagree with that. We've made a, a point from the first day to always pay our contributors. It's always been a very, very important part for us. Um, so we pay everyone, um, and then there's some other miscellaneous costs that you get, like research and travel and blah, blah, blah. That's basically, that's the money going out, that's expenses. Then the money coming in is the partnerships, so our advertising partnerships from the, some of the companies that I mentioned, people who will take our ads or other things in the magazine that help us have money in the pot to begin with to, to, to do what we do. And then the other thing, of course, is unit sales, so actually selling the magazine. Um, now, a lot of people assume that you know, most of our money comes from selling the magazine. Actually, I don't, that's not the case at the moment. Our partnership, is, uh, our partnership uh, income is, is stronger than our, than our sales, and that's pretty much the way with any magazine, um, as far as I can tell. Um, if you're relying purely on sales, and this can be said for many products, um, then that's not necessarily going to become sustainable. Obviously, it, it varies massively, but for us, we found, we found this works. And this is, this is, as I say, this is the model. So if all of our money in can pay for this stuff over there, then when we sell anything, if, sorry, if our partnerships can pay for the stuff over there, then any time we sell a magazine, we're in profit. And as of the third issue, I'm very happy to say that we were in profit from before we sold the first issue, which is great. Now that, being in profit, then that might sound like, oh my god, wow, like he's making loads of money. That's not the case at all, because we're not getting paid for our time, our many, many, many hours that we're putting into it. So profit is kind of, you know, profit, because it, it, it depends. We're, uh, we haven't paid ourselves up until that point, so um, it's got nice to have something. Um, and so this is kind of, this is kind of my, my mantra, I suppose. It's okay to make money. Uh, and I think that a sustainable business is a business that is able to make enough money to pay the people who create the product. So that's us, that's our contributors, and that's it, basically. But as long as everyone gets paid, and it's fair, then I think that's okay. And there's a little caveat to that, which is enough, little asterisk, that bit is up to you. Maybe it's okay that you just pay your contributors and you don't make a thing, and that's fine, because you're just doing it for fun, you're just doing it on the side, it's totally cool. Maybe it's that you want to leave your job and you want to go and start a gigantic empire and you need loads of money. And that's your motivation. Personally, for us, it's like enough money that it, we kind of feel that we're getting paid for the amount of time we put into it um, and that it's something that we can continue doing. Um, I want the magazine to be successful and I think the only way to do that is for us knowing that we are actually making money with each issue. Otherwise, we're going to have to stop at some point. This is a quote from one of our contributors. Uh, she's, I said, look, we pay everyone, it's really important. Like, we haven't got loads of cash to pay you with, um, but like, we really believe it's important to pay our contributors. And she said, as long as there is something offered, I consider it a nod of respect, and that's all I need. And that made me really, really happy, um, especially because knowing that a lot of other magazine publishers that we know don't pay their contributors at all. That seems to be the norm. Ian Coyle, who's a friend of mine and a really fantastic designer, he's, uh, he and Dwayne King are those guys responsible for uh, doing that really cool Parallax stuff with the Nike Better World site, long before Parallax was cool, remember that? Then, of course, everyone does it now. But these guys kind of semi-invented it back when it was pretty groundbreaking. Uh, anyway, really talented designer, and one of those crazy designers who's like super amazing developer as well. Anyway, I interviewed him for uh, the first issue of Eight Faces, and actually the name Eight Faces came from came from him, essentially, because he was talking about how he likes to... We did a South by, um, South by Southwest panel together, and he said about typographic choice, and he was saying, actually, he doesn't really like to have that many fonts to choose from, that actually only have, having eight typefaces to choose from is better for him. Um, so that's kind of where the motivation came. But anyway, his quote, which I really, really like, we printed in the first issue, but I think is super relevant to loads of things. He says, typically, we judge success on impression-based metrics but I look more towards expression-based metrics. How much do people actually care about it? And I think that's something that is nice to bear in mind when we're worrying about how many likes and 
follows and retweets and stuff like that we're getting. So here's a conclusion as I'm slowly approaching, or quickly approaching uh, the end. So four points. The first thing I'd like to say is that I feel that screen-based design has no permanence. And one of, that, one of those things is that I, as I said, I, I struggle to collect a lot of old work. Like, unless you're, if you're a web designer, if you're going to be, a who you know, does development as well, if you want to save a version of a website that you've done for a client, it really means, you know, having your own server, doing a complete backup of the database, com keeping it completely in sync with the live site, maintaining that for years, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. It's pretty hard to, to do that. Um, again, apps versioning, um, you know, different platforms changing. It's very hard to recall a lot of that stuff. And so for me, I personally like to jump between media so that I can feel that there's some, I'm doing something that has some sense of, of permanence. And uh, related to that, it's really hard to stay sane doing one thing. Now, that's certainly true for myself. Maybe you guys are, uh, have got a much better attention span than me. Uh, but personally, I know that I've always liked to do different projects. I generally don't like working on projects that take a long time. Um, so client projects, I always wanted to go for shorter, shorter periods of time. Things that would roll on for months kind of drove me crazy. Um, and just doing loads of different stuff, I wanted to do print design for the reasons that I just explained, but also other things, like I said, you know, doing writing, um, doing speaking, doing music making, doing some photography for the magazine, things like that, just kind of keeps me sane. I just, I just feel like I, I get to do something which is wildly different from what I'm meant to be doing in my you know, so-called day job. And um, yeah, and it, it's, it's, really, it's really nice, and I've realized over the years that that's the only way that I, I stay enjoying anything, is by, is by mixing it up. I think that life is too short to work on projects that you don't believe in. And so that's, again, feeling that you know, doing the right thing, doing something that you personally find fun or that you have a really great reason for other than just you should be doing it. I think that's really, really important. And a lot of the time that means doing side projects because maybe in your day job or your client work you're not able to get creatively fulfilled so, or scratch your own itch. So you know, go off and create you know, a site or an app or or a magazine or whatever, just to, to fulfill, fulfill yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's also nothing wrong with making money. Like I said, it's not about like, bringing in loads of profits. You know, I'm not involved in that kind of venture capital world or anything like that. I, I don't get any of that stuff. But um, I, I'm interested in continuing to do the things that I love doing. And I know, because I live in the Western world and I'm you know, realistic, that in order to do that, I need money to survive. And you know, I need to pay the mortgage. I need, I've got a young daughter now, so I need to make sure I can, I can afford to kind of keep her looked after. And so there's nothing wrong with making money. I think we, especially in the web world, have a little bit of a stigma with that. Uh, there's a little bit of a, you know, no one wants to discuss money, no one wants to talk about how much you're making, no one wants to talk about this idea of like doing really well. And, and yet at the other end of the scale, you've got people, you know, VC people and whatnot talking about, you know, acquisitions worth billions and billions and Silicon Valley craziness and all sorts of stuff like that. So there's this real um, disparity, I think, between those two things. So I, I would say I think it's okay to just do some projects and, um, and not feel bad about wanting them to be sustainable. Sustainable in the sense that you can carry on doing them because they pay you. Uh, the talk title I said about uh, being paid to um, drink craft beer. So let me just explain that a little bit. This is the first issue of the magazine, I think. Um, so we did this thing where one of our sponsors is beermerchants.com, who are a UK-based sort of craft beer distributor. And we said, how about you guys give us a crate of beer and we will write about them. Like, you send them to me, <laughs> I'll drink them. And I'll take pictures, and I'll write about each one, and then we'll give that thing away. You can then put another crate together, and we'll send that to a lucky, uh, lucky reader. And they said, yeah, cool. So I was like, hey, OK, amazing. And then for the second issue, we did it again, except I said, hey, why don't we like, make our own like, Largom IPA case, and I'll choose the IPA. So I was sitting there one morning um, at the computer, like scrolling and scrolling through beer merchants, like looking at all the different IPAs and adding them to like my wish list. And my wife came in and she was like, I thought you were working. Like we've got loads of stuff on. Like with the magazine, what are you doing? You're just like looking at beer merchants, ordering IPAs. And I was like, no, 
this is a legitimate business activity. <laughs> I'm doing this for the magazine, and I'm going to get these beers, and I'm going to taste them, and I'm going to write about them, and then we're going to give them away to a reader. And it's totally legit. And I was really pleased that I had reached that stage in my life. <laughs> anyway, just before we go, um, uh, just a little uh, thank you to you guys for listening to me ramble on. Um, if anyone is interested in having a look at Log On magazine, I've put together this little discount code, which will get you 25% off. Uh, I think it expires at midnight tonight. So if anyone's interested in that, the website is, is uh, readlogon.com. Um, same for all the social media handles, all that fun stuff. And the promo code you'll need is blendwebmix25. And um, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Liat. Thank you, Amir. Merci. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps the, um, we're running out of time, so for the one that, uh, that could have questions, for Elliot, there's the coffee break right now, and I think you'll be, be available at coffee. I will, yes. So just, just go and uh, grab a coffee with, uh, with Elliot.